uh, hello all uh, uh, welcome to our webinar uh, i'll just hand it over to our uh, youth professional riksa to take it forward from me Hello, everybody. I hope I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so, hello, everybody. My name is Riksa Imtiaz, and I'm a young professional at CDRI. It brings me immense joy to welcome you all to today's immersive webinar on building infrastructure resilience inclusively, integrating gender and recovery and reconstruction. So before we move forward, I feel thrilled to announce that this webinar marks the culmination of all the activities done under the IDRI campaign, which was launched by CDRI under its Y for RI program and as CDRI's youth engagement for pre-COP26. I would take this opportunity to introduce and welcome our moderator, Ms. Anju Sharma. Anju has, is currently the lead for locally led action at Global Center on Adaptation. She has served at eminent positions throughout her career. She has been the deputy director of Oxford Climate Policy, head of the policy and publication units of the European Capacity Building Initiative, senior policy advisor at Oxfam, program officer at the UNEP and associate director at the Center for Science and Environment. She has also worked as a consultant for several multilateral and bilateral organizations. Anju, I'm pleased to have you here moderate this session for us. Welcome to CDRI. So before we begin the discussion, I request Mr. Tanaji Sain, Director Advocacy and Partnership CDRI to deliver the special address and kickstart the event. Over to you, Tanaji. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rigza, uh, for the opening and for welcoming Anju uh, as the moderator for this session. Um, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have joined us today uh, for this very topical and interesting dialogue, which, as you heard from Rigza, is part of our pre-COP engagement um, under the thematic of Youth for Climate 2021 Driving Ambition. Before speaking a bit about CDRI, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. I want to particularly thank our panelists and all the competitors uh, who participated in the campaign. Uh, CDRI is a multi-stakeholder partnership of national governments, UN and multilateral development banks and private sector actors. We aim to fundamentally work on promoting the resilience of infrastructure systems to disaster and climate risks and thereby ensure sustainable development. As a growing organization, we are currently at 30, 33 members of whom 26 are national governments and seven are in national organizations, including two private sector networks. Fundamental to our work is the belief that youth engagement is crucial for mobilizing and influencing the climate adaptation narrative for now and the future. This will be essential to trigger transformative social and economic change through infrastructure resilience. Towards this aim, we ran our campaign on imagining disaster resilient infrastructure with global youth over the months of August and September, and we had a fantastic response to that. The initiative intends to make infrastructure resilience more tangible while bringing forth the essential human and community interfaces of resilience building. The IDRI campaign, uh, we hope, has also helped focus and garner youth awareness and engagement on the subject of disaster resilience of infrastructure. This dialogue um, marks the culmination of this campaign event by inviting youth voices, our panelists, on inclusion, to reflect on inclusion and in infrastructure recovery and reconstruction by drawing on the global experience and expertise of our keynote speaker. CDRI has identified recovery and reconstruction as one of its thematic priorities and visualizes reconstruction as an opportunity to invest in the resilience of communities, underpinned by the notion of build back better. We promote the importance of inclusivity and reconstruction for not just restoring physical infrastructure and communities to their pre-disaster conditions, but also for taking the opportunity to create safer, sustainable and inclusive recovery. We believe that this will drive the agenda of not, not leaving anyone behind. Last but not the least, I take the opportunity to extend my heartiest congratulations to the winners of the international competition. Your entries along with the, alongside the 170 others accentuated our understanding of disaster resilience of infrastructure 
and showcases the sense um, true essence globally. And finally, thank you, Anju, for agreeing to moderate this dialogue. And I now hand over to you to take this forward. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Tanaji. Thank you, Riksa, also for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our speakers and participants. And a really warm welcome to today's discussion. I know that we have participants at least from as far east as India, if not further, and from uh, Trinidad and Tobago in the west. So I'm Anju Sharma, and as Riksa said, I work with the Global Center on Adaptation. And uh, which some, uh, you, you may know that it's an international organization that works on accelerating action on support for adaptation around the world. And we have programs on infrastructure, on youth leadership, food security, water and urban issues and climate finance. And I myself work on locally led action, which is a cross cutting issue. It focuses not only on more inclusive adaptation, but also on actually empowering communities and the most vulnerable to, you know, take the lead in planning and implementation by providing them with the capacity and the resources that they need. So today we're going to explore the intersection between infrastructure, gender, resilience, particularly climate resilience, and specifically in the context of disaster recovery and reconstruction. And we'll also be talking about the role of youth. So uh, that is quite a lot of intersectionalities. And as you know, that it's, it's, it's quite difficult not just for us uh, uh, speakers, but many times more so for the implementers on the ground who tend to be very focused on their own disciplines and more so in the time of crisis when, uh, you know, during post-disaster relief operations, et cetera. So before we hear from our stellar cast of speakers, what I thought I would do is try to, you know, unpick the topics a bit, focusing specifically on infrastructure and gender and then let the speakers bring it all, the pieces back uh, for us and including sort of bringing in the youth perspective. So first, what are we talking about when we say infrastructure? We're not just talking about the hard infrastructure, you know, like uh, roads for transport, energy services, uh, water, sanitation, hospitals. We're talking about disaster management and response systems, about digital infrastructure, which, which is really, really important in post-disaster, for instance, in uh, you know, helping women access uh, support from government services, et cetera. But we're also talking about the services that this infrastructure provides for women, whether it's for livelihood or for overall well-being, for health, education, financial security, legal institutions, public spaces, cultural institutions, etc. And then the gender element. So when we talk about gender in the context of climate change, and more specifically post-disaster recovery and infrastructure, we can sort of uh, cut, uh, you know cut it up into perhaps two perspectives or more, depending on how you uh, look at it. But first, there's the differential vulnerability and adaptive capacity of women, that uh, they, they tend to be more vulnerable, they have lower ad adaptive capacity. And the second is the positive role and the very strong and important role that they can play in resilience building efforts and uh, how they can benefit for some of the opportunities that can arise uh, as we address the climate crisis. So first let's pick, uh, unpick the uh, differential vulnerability and adaptive capacity. We, we know that women have more limited access to the services that infrastructure can provide, whether it's water, food, energy, sanitation, jobs, health services, education. And that means that they have a lower adaptive capacity, which will be made worse by disasters. It's going to increase their work burden. It's going to limit the amount of time they can spend on income generation and you know, the time that they can spend on training, education, participating in governance, maintaining their health, et cetera. And we also know that an increased workload means that parents or guardians will take out girls from school so that they can carry out household and agricultural tasks. 
There's also evidence recently from a report by IUCN that the pressures of environmental degradation and climate change actually lead to increased violence and sexual harassment and abuse against women and girls. So for instance, women and girls are more subject to trafficking and gender-based violence after a disaster. So all of these factors undermine the capacity of women to cope and adapt to the negative impacts of climate change. Now, the second element relates to the really important and positive role that women can play in increasing resilience, not just of themselves, but of society at large. For this to happen, they need to have equal access to jobs. They have to be processes in place that engage them, uh, you know, and women from different socioeconomic backgrounds to make sure that their voices are heard. And uh, we know, for instance, that there's potential for more than 65 million new jobs as a result of climate action. How are we going to ensure that women have equal access? Not only because that's fair, but also because it's really important to ensure that women are represented in the jobs and that their priorities are heard and, interest, uh, and addressed. So this is both in public and private sectors, ministries of planning and infrastructure, different levels of government, you know, the boards of private sector organizations, Female decision making, uh, uh, participation in decision making is, you know, we know from past experience that it's linked to socioeconomic progress, higher spending on health, education, better quality of institutions, but they're still, they're a minority in many important decision making and policy making forums and institutions. And uh, we know that when it comes to infrastructure specifically, the needs and priorities of women can be different. Their, how they use infrastructure can be different. I mean, just to tell you a short story from my own experience, I was in Malda in West Bengal, evaluating an adaptation program at the rural level. And we first spoke to the men, this was a village, a, a, a fairly poor village in Malda. And uh, it, it, we could have a very focused discussion on climate change because they knew exactly how the weather was changing, how it was impacting them, how it was making it really difficult for them to take decisions on what to plant because when they prepared for floods, they got droughts and vice versa. And then we had a focused discussion with the women and the moment the men went away, you know, the women, they immediately said, yeah, all this climate change thing is fine, but you know, the first thing we'd like is toilets, please. So, you know, when the immediate needs, when basic needs are not met, how can you start, start talking about sort of uh, future threats or, well, imminent, uh, current threats as well, but lower on the priority perhaps. And in particular, when resources are limited, then their priorities, the priorities of women compete with other interests, whether it's, well, of, uh, you know, uh, um, priorities of men or of the private sector, et cetera. So it's really important that the process of achieving climate resilience, whether it's in a post-disaster context or otherwise, it's designed in a way that not only prevents further erosion of gender equality, but it actually works towards it and it reduces vulnerability and provides an empowering environment for women. Now, what are some of the challenges that we face in achieving this? We have the right people in the room to answer these questions for us. So I invite the audience, I think you're already doing it, but to take advantage of this opportunity and uh, give, uh, send us your questions in the chat box as we go through our sessions. And uh, what we're going to do is we have a one hour session where uh, we're going to uh, go through the panelists. We have our stage setting presentation. We'll go through the panelists and then in the end, we'll take your questions. So um, let's start then with the stage set setting presentation by Rita Misal. Rita is a post-disaster recovery practitioner with over 20 years of experience. Rita, I read your blog and uh, saw that you started work during uh, in the aftermath of the super cyclone in Orissa in 1999. So you really sort of have that experience on the ground and uh, in, in the work that you've done since you've emphasized the human face of disaster and particularly its impacts on vulnerable groups. So Rita's uh, key areas of expertise include disaster risk reduction, post disaster recovery, climate change, and working with people with disabilities in crisis contexts. And she's also led UNDP's global efforts in conducting COVID-19 recovery needs assessments. So welcome, Rita. You have uh, seven minutes, and I'm going to ask you three questions. 
Why is it critical to address women's needs in infrastructure provisions during relief operations? What are the gaps and challenges that exist in integrating gender-based considerations in the disaster recovery systems and climate adaptation work in infrastructure? And what policies, governance measures, implementation mechanisms do we need to create an enabling environment for mainstreaming gender in recovery and reconstruction for infrastructure? Go ahead, please, Rita. Over to you. Thank you, Anju. Thank you, CDRI, uh, Mr. Tanaji Sen, uh, uh, Riz, and others uh, for inviting me to this very, very important discussion, something I'm very passionate about. And we've uh, already heard uh, very clear um, you know, challenges that Anju has put forth. Thank you, Anju, for uh, opening uh, this session with the right uh, thoughts. I would go into uh, this discussion as I go into it for my seven minutes. Anju, may I just have a request at the five minute point, if you can just remind me that I have two minutes left, that will help me you know, wrap up a little bit better. Uh, so for the three questions that Anju, you have put for me, I think uh, you've already outlined uh, the, the, why it is critical to address women's needs and in infrastructure. I'd like to look at it from another angle as well. You know, you already have a lot of statistics about death, uh, data on death in disasters where women seem to be um, much higher uh, than men in many cases. Then workforce participation of women in key sectors, particularly which provide food and security, health sectors, service sectors is extremely high as relative to men. And then the third thing is that, you know, uh, reproductive and community responsibilities provide the support structure for men's engagement in work. You know, and I like to go back to a very basic uh, understanding of what an economy is, because I'm, at the end of the day, you know, people understand economy in different ways. For me, it's important to recognize uh, that in a disaster or following a disaster or any crisis for that matter, be it the pandemic at this context, we cannot ignore such a large event ongoing right now. Uh, that some aspects of an economy usually as an overdrive, right? Uh, you know, and if one recalls that one, the definition of the word economy comes from the Greek word meaning to manage the household. This helps to bring the focus that become women become actually much more busier in the care economy of taking care of loved ones, provisioning supplies, and finding ways to offset the enormous economic and social burdens of this time. These aspects of the economy usually go uncounted and hidden, yet you would understand that there is no economy without these activities, right? So that's one of the key elements and I would like to put forward, uh, other than the factors that Anju has very eloquently you know, marked out as to why there should be changes in the way uh, women's needs to be addressed in infrastructure. In terms of challenges, I think, and I'd like to bring uh, two, or big, two or three big ticket items here. One is that, you know, after having done around 10, 20 assessments, myself led many more. I realized at the end of it, when we finished the assessment, hardly 1% or the fraction of the budget for recovery is allocated either to women's ministries, directly to women's program. Or the, and so what happens is that, you know, in the end, all of it goes into, uh, Anju, what you mentioned as hard infrastructure, which is roads and buildings and stuff like that, leaving out almost nothing for women's ministries or gender ministries or health services, education services, or even uh, social support services. That's one, one big uh, gap and challenge I notice. Secondly, I would like to bring out here that infrastructure design is mainly, uh, mostly a male domain. You know, it leaves out, you know, so we have fine designs, which is brought in, particularly after a big crisis or after a large disaster, architects and engineers from for large public infrastructure is usually internationally appointed with very limited cultural context, you know, for a design that is not necessarily friendly or not necessarily the most amenable towards local needs of women or women on a particular culture and ethnicity. Therefore, you know, you have actually uh, design buildings done in a very top, in a short time frame, which is high budget, you know, at the end of the day, you find that they don't recognize what local women needs. You mentioned the issue of toilets, even the way toilets are made in a large public infrastructure where they are located, have a huge impact on how women would participate in any public space building, you know, so that impacts there. Uh, that that's one uh, one critical point that I wanted to bring out. The third one I realized that also that uh, 
you know, the women's access to resources, you already mentioned that. I would like to mention that about, you know, you know uh, the tangible assets, you know, there's one tangible asset as land, house, livelihood related assets, but the intangible assets such as knowledge, information, participation uh, um, in public forums, healthcare, child support, etc. All of it generally impact, you know, lead to greater inequalities among women and generally impact their capacity to recover from a mini, any crisis. So this becomes more pronounced when you see the intersectionality of gender with age, ethnicity, social status, be it in a single woman, married woman, divorced woman, aged women, or even the economic status. You know, so I think just a broad understanding about how, uh, you know, the issue of gender intersects with age, ethnicity, social status, uh, and economic status is extremely important. And this is a huge challenge that we need to understand. Finally, you know, I feel sometimes that we, we do recovery assessments, you know, uh, there is hardly any emphasis on, on uh, sex and gender disaggregated data. So what happened is that there is a very gender blind recovery plan resulting in a highly missed opportunities for inclusive and gender recovery. Coming to what exactly we can do, you know, I think what is critical in this is, you know, um, institutional frameworks which have provided for a legal formal space for women's participation, including women in rep representation in all levels of decision making and governance from the national to subnational is extremely important. You know, give the women space, public space, you know, and let them be the public face also, not public space, but also public face in things that bring accountability, auditing, you know, just uh, as opposed to hi hiring women who could be, you know, male czars, you know, we usually have this concept of having czars or CEOs after disasters, where we have mostly men, rarely you would see a woman leading such an effort. So why don't we have women leading such a public effort? You know, the recent example in India was Kerala, but internationally you would see, you know, um, uh, um, Chancellor Merkel, uh, you would see Jacinda Arlen, um, even uh, Tai Taipei, you know, uh, the leader there who has been providing very able leadership in a COVID-19 crisis. So they became the public face of a crisis. And therefore, this is one important step that, you know, governments could take, make women the public face of crisis, put them in positions where they can question, you know, they're free to question and account, you know, make people accountable for things that might not uh, be favorable towards supporting other women. Number two is, you know, you mentioned, Anju, about jobs. I would like to think about more about retraining for the professional mobility. Oftentimes, we are very happy when we are able to move women from being just laborers to masons, you know. And this, of course, this is a change in the status for women. But here we are talking about in the face of climate change, you mentioned about 65 million jobs. There is a space for green jobs. How about using women's access you know, to retrain them and allow their professional mobility, but also to access to capital outside service sectors. That means not only in health and, you know, uh, that kind of areas, but renewable energy, environmental management, infrastructure gen uh, development through gender equality policies. Next is, you know, how do we include or rebuild the state social infrastructure so much so that women will actually have time freed up to participate in paid economic activities. So it's not only about being part of the care economy, which has almost sometimes uh, no money attached to it. Here we are talking about being able to provide the infrastructure, education, health, and childcare support at home so that women can actually go out and you know, get um, uh, engaged in well-paid economic activities. Then the other thing is that, you know, I would like to also bring out that sometimes we, we think about social assistance programs as something that pays, you know, uh, women, you know, sometimes we do pensions and women get some sort of benefits out of that. The social assistance program should be, you know, raised to the minimum wage level of a daily wage. So at the end of the month, they would receive a substantial amount, not a pittance, you know, and this is what happens. Normally, social assistance programs is really a pittance. It does not give any woman space to actually decide what to do with that money because they're just using that money for milk or grocery or something like that. There is no space to do anything beyond their very urgent need, leave alone their health issues. So social assistance programs review for women should be reviewed very carefully to see that, you know, they match into, you know, uh, they match the wage levels, increase it to reduce dependencies on men. Then I mentioned about gender audits for all recovery 
um, programs, but also to include, include budgets for social technical facilitation to increase women's participation. You know, and this is very important because, you know, when we construct houses, we automatically assume that, you know, houses are going to get constructed but because there's a budget allocated to it. What we don't realize is that actually the whole process of owning a house has to be facilitated, extremely carefully thought process in which women can actually be a owner of a house, design the house themselves, and then start living in it, you know. And so that is extremely important to think through about how a socio-technical facilitation element should be added to all uh, recovery programs uh, for facilitating women's participation. And this has been done successfully, you know. Normally what has happened is the budget is not allocated. So NGOs who are in, who facilitate women's participation in recovery programs often have to pay out of pocket expenses for doing that. You know, instead of doing that, the program should recognize that this is a legitimate expenditure and there should be 15% or 20% allocated from the national budget towards just facilitation of women uh, into uh, reconstruction programs. Uh, secondly, I think collect and analyze and publish as much as possible disaggregated data. You know, and we we sometimes do the collection, we sometimes do the analysis, but barely you will find that you would have published data that is available for women to talk about and to work with. And finally, what I would like to say is that you know we should encourage um, a circular economy where women prove to be better managers. And industries that design out waste, that very little waste and pollution is there because they're very good at recycling products and material, and they support regeneration of national ecosystem. These are areas where women excel. And so we should be able to encourage to make sure that women manage, you know, give the space to manage these capacities extremely well. At the end, what I would like to say, what should we aim for in three things I would like to say, make structural changes in planning and budgeting for women allocation of funds for social services, create budget for agencies to support women's change in the recovery phase. That's number one. Number two is stop treating women as beneficiaries, you know, allow them to become the benefactor, overturn stereotypes by giving them new opportunities for public engagement, jobs that pay more and improve the social st uh, status, create and increase their own ownership and access to resources, both tangible and intangible, and then, you know, have a greater recognition of care uh, economy. While you're doing this, address the issues of safety and harassment in public offices that manage recovery processes, because unless you do that, women will not come out into the public. So I've already mentioned this, and I would like to emphasize this again, make women the public face of recovery. Appoint women CEOs, SARs, include them in the disaster response force, audit and accountability forums, make them the communications directors, you know, so they are the ones who are, you know, who are the ones who are talking, their communication, you know, will reach out to many more women than it normally would if it is a CEO, male CEO talking. I, I believe if you, if we do all of this, we not only build back better to use a very often now almost cliched form, but leap forward to a more inclusive and better future. And I think all of us should be aiming you know, for a structural changes rather than, you know, just practical small changes that we would see. Thank you, I'd like to stop here. Thanks Rita, you didn't need reminding on the time. You did very well and thanks also for the really important points that you raised. I mean, I think it uh, sometimes feels that you're making progress, but, but the moment you dig down into an issue, you just realize that it's not enough. And what we actually need is, you know, again, an often used and sometimes abused phrase, but transformational change. And that's just far too slow in coming. So really thanks for that very, very thought provoking um, uh, talk that you just gave us. I'm gonna call on the other panelists now to um, sort of come back to us with their comments on what you've just said. Is Brighton here? Has Brighton joined us now? He's there, I can see him, yes. Thanks, Brighton. So we'll start with Brighton Kaoma. He's the Global Director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, youth, their youth initiative in New York, which works on SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And Brighton himself, he's the 20, 2015 recipient of the Queen's Young Leaders Award 
from Queen Elizabeth, and he holds a master's in public administration from Columbia University in New York City. So Brighton, my question to you is this, how can women be provided with local employment opportunities based on their skills and knowledge to create a more gender responsive recovery? You have six minutes and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be joining everybody um, this morning in this part of the world and afternoon on the other side of the world, depending on where you are. Um, I think this very topic we're discussing today is extremely important. And it's a topic that really resonates with everybody. Uh, but I will take my approach with a full recognition that issues of gender are not homogeneous. When we look at women empowerment, they are context-based, context-specific. I was born in Zambia in Southern Africa, and I grew up in a setting where women played a critical role. They were the leaders, they were the decision makers, they were uh, the people that guided our upbringing. They were the people that transferred knowledge to us through uh, oral tradition. They are the ones that gave us direction and provided sage counsel. So I saw firsthand the role that women played even in disaster situations. Being raised in a peri-urban community, it, I could see how during diseases, women would always come to the fore and play critical roles. But again, this begins to boil down to what are some of the specific policy frameworks and fundamentals that we need to make sure that uh, women continue to take the lead, but most importantly, in post-disaster situations, are given the, the much needed opportunities for job creation and livelihoods. And I want to recognize that while the post-disaster context presents a host of challenges for women, I think it is important to recognize that women are not just victims of disasters, but rather they are significant evidence, um, but, but, but rather as, as evidence demonstrates, they are powerful agents of change during and after disasters. And I think we have quite a number of anecdotes that we can point to. For example, in the aftermath of Hurricane Mitch that devastated Honduras and uh, Nicaragua in the 1998, we saw that women organized disaster recovery efforts and that included hauling cement and building temporary shelters and latrines, in addition to overtaking governance initiatives and working to restore livelihoods. We've also seen quite a number of other key anecdotes that point to this evidence of women leading very instrumental efforts in the post-recovery process. For example, after the 2015 earthquake in Nepal, we saw that women played a crucial role in rebuilding efforts despite the uh, disproportionate impact that the disaster had on them. Uh, some women were also trained as, uh, as masons to help in the repair process of infrastructure. So they play a critical role and we've seen anecdotes has also been described by the speakers before me. Another critical example I would want to cite is that of Mexico in 2017 when a series of earthquakes prompted women's group to step up and collectively contribute to rescue efforts and rebuilding their communities. Yet, too often we see women's contribution in recovery and reconstruction being undervalued or invincible, despite evidence that demonstrate deeper and more sustainable recovery can be achieved when promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. But in terms of job creation, I think what tops the list is ensuring that at macro policy level, we ensure that there's an integration of quality, equality rather, and women's empowerment in the recovery framework. So any government recovery framework uh, should be focused on utmost equality and women's empowerment in their recovery frameworks. This should also include sector-based recovery plans, um, as well as other monitoring and evaluation frameworks for equitable resource allocation and needs prioritization. So that becomes extremely, extremely relevant. Secondly, we also need to ensure that to create more jobs and ensure that there is more 
uh, stronger uh, women empowerment, especially in post disaster recovery, we need to ensure that policy and legal frameworks address gender equality and women's empowerment, which is a precursor to my first point. But most importantly, for us to create an environment which promotes full women empowerment, we need to resist stereotypes. And by resisting stereotypes, I mean resisting stereotypes both at macro levels, but also at community levels. And this means avoiding that gender roles, sex roles and sexual orientation becomes differentiating factors in terms of the capacity to recover. But also we should base all initiatives on knowledge of different and specific cultural, economic, political uh, and sexual context and not on forced general, generalities. And I think that becomes even extremely, extremely important. But Lastly, I would want to also mention that uh, finance is critical. Financing skills development, financing women-led businesses, financing women-led support groups that provide both social and economic benefits to their well-being, so that in post-disaster uh, recovery, we've built a very stronger infrastructure, specifically for women business owners and women leaders in communities. So even prior to disaster recovery, we need to make sure that we create a much stronger foundation, a foundation that will make uh, women even more resilient. They're already resilient and they've shown us how resilient and hardworking they are based on the different case studies that I've spoken about, but the foundation should begin both in pre-disaster uh, uh, and in post-disaster. And now with the COVID-19 showing us that it's really important to begin prioritizing investments in women-led enterprises, but also most importantly, ensuring that we have the best policies that create a good enabling environment for women to perform, to thrive, to grow and to support each other. So those would be the critical elements and I would want to end my submissions there. That's exactly on time. Thanks, Brighton. Thank you very much. And again, you know, I think um, what you said, I've, I've heard it before that that women clearly, it is context specific, that there are situations where they're more empowered, that, you know, they play a lead role. But I think even there, it's perhaps not recognized or, um, as you yourself said, that, that you know, it, it's um, undervalued, so to speak. So let's move on to our next panelist, which is um, Darren. And uh, no, sorry, it's, it's Rory, who is the US delegate to the G20 Youth Summit, and uh, the, which focuses on economic and externalities of, no, sorry, Rory focuses on economics and externalities of disability exclusion in the United States. She is a human rights advocate with a master's in human rights from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And she currently supplements her local level work by serving at several organizations, including the International Association for Political Science Students, the Coalition for the UN We Need, and the UN Association of the United States of America. So Rory, you have nine minutes to tell us how climate change exacerbates the vulnerability of disabled women and how it can be addressed. Over to you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to address you all this morning in my role as the US delegate to the G20 Youth Summit, as well as a communications associate with the Coalition for the UN We Need. Uh, Aditya, if you could please share the slides. Thank you. So uh, next slide, please. So. I'm going to be discussing the ways that climate change affects people with disabilities and particularly women with disabilities to underscore the importance of resilient infrastructure. So just a brief overview of the disability data. The people with disabilities actually represents the world's largest minority population. It's about 15% of the global population, according to the United Nations. There is a higher prevalence of disability in developing countries. We're going to get into that a little bit later about how that is related to the climate. And a 110 to 190 million people experience significant disabilities, which, as we will discuss soon, is exacerbated by the climate. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to discuss the relationship between 
uh, the SDG climate change and the other SDGs and how that particularly impacts women with disabilities. So first and foremost, people with disabilities are twice as likely to live in poverty. 50% of all working age adults that have experienced one year of poverty happen to have a disability. Two thirds of those in long-term poverty have a disability. And this is very important to think about because poverty affects your ability to access housing. And because people with disabilities are more likely to live in poverty, they are more inclined to live in housing that happens to be in flood zones. They live in areas where there are high rises without evacuation plans. And the poverty affects the ability for them to migrate, especially when we think about how a lot of governments do not plan for accessible evacuations in the face of a climate emergency. This also relates to hunger. When there's a rise in temperature, it destroys the food crops and exacerbates food insecurity. And that can have an impact on gender equality as well. When there's a drought or a flood, there will be less food. And then the men will often have to relocate to make money to avoid poverty, which will leave the women at home. And in certain countries that will actually predispose them to violence when they are left alone without male protection. Now, we can also think about this in the context of healthcare. Healthcare and clean water in particular, so that's SDG3 and SDG6. Climate change obviously affects the access to clean air. And so when there's a higher temperature, there might be a raised ozone layer and more pollutants, which can increase and exacerbate respiratory and cardiac issues. This can also affect access to safe drinking water and heighten the risk of waterborne diseases and create breeding grounds for, for disease carrying insects. And this can also contribute to birth defects. This can affect women's, um, this can affect maternal health. This can affect maternal mortality as well. And these are just things to keep in mind. And when we think about the relationship to people with disabilities, this can actually exacerbate um, birth defects as well. Obviously, there are a lot of things to consider when it comes down to healthcare. When there are areas with weak health infrastructure, they won't be able to cope without assistance to prepare an inclusive and accessible disaster response. And women are more likely to be left behind because they are less likely to be able to obtain healthcare in various countries. And so then you can also think about this in terms of education, where women in many areas have less access to education. And when, when information is not included in an accessible format that can affect people's ability to make proper decisions to take care of themselves and to create an evacuation plan with women less likely to be with women less likely to attend school in various areas or less likely to be able to have this climate knowledge it can really impact them and acknowledging that people with disabilities are less likely to be included in mainstream education this can have an extraordinary impact on them now, I'd like to go into climate action and employment, but I think that that was also very well said before me, um, but I can go into it about how climate change can, and people with disabilities can, how dis, people with disabilities can disproportionately experience employment discrimination and how you can actually use remote working to mitigate um, some pressures on the climate. So as it stands, people with disabilities are the most underemployed minority group because there's not a lot of inclusive infrastructure to be able to get them to and from various places. And when you think about how you, you have to have private ridership, like for example, Accessoride, to be able to get people with disabilities from place to place, it can really, really impact their employment prospects. However, remote working actually decreases the demand for public infrastructure. It decreases the demand for private ridership and create, can create opportunities for people with disabilities and particularly women with disabilities. So next slide, please. I think, yes. <laughs> So we can obviously go into SDG 11, which talks about the relationship between uh, climate, which talks about the importance of creating sustainable cities. And I think that all of the previous points that I raised about the relationship between poverty and hunger and health and also education highlights the importance of creating inclusive infrastructure to be able to address these particular challenges. So I'm going to talk a little bit about BCID versus the city of New York which is one of the cases that actually inspired my focus on this particular subject. So it was a landmark class action case where 900,000 people filed um, a lawsuit against the city of New York 
for not creating accessible evacuation plans. So people with wheelchairs, for example, had to call 311, which is basically like a general service here in the city of New York. And they had to be on hold for a long period of time without necessarily getting information about how they should evacuate or what they or how help could reach them. And so there was limit accessoride as well to even evacuate them. And as previously mentioned, people with disabilities are more likely to live in flood zones. They're more likely to live in those high rises. And so as a result, they were stranded. They were left without oxygen. And it really did show the importance of making sure that information was included in an accessible format. And I want to go over the importance of creating inclusive, resilient infrastructure to be able to address these things. So to address these particular issues, governments need to invest in inclusive infrastructure, we need to do more to ameliorate the poverty levels among people with disabilities, and particularly women with disabilities who are more inclined to face gender-based discrimination and particularly domestic violence as a result of their economic status. It is important to think about how we can create accessible evacuation plans. And one suggestion that was brought up at the G20 Youth Summit was to use algorithms to basically predict which areas are more likely to be impacted by particular natural disasters like hurricanes as they come and create evacuation plans based on that. And also use these algorithms to implement the Green New Deal and particularly the Green New Deal in public housing, which talks about the importance of investing in resilient infrastructure for public housing. But you can use these algorithms to determine which areas will be the most impacted, which areas will have the highest level of damage, which areas will cost the most to repair, and then implement the Green New Deal based on what those algorithms show. Because we currently use algorithms to determine where people are more likely to face housing discrimination already. So we can use what we already have to essentially create a recovery plan that would ultimately save us money in the long run, because at the end of the day, there are a lot of issues with being able to afford the recovery plans. A lot of people say, well, we would like to have green infrastructure, but we just simply can't afford it. But one thing that we end up doing is we end up wasting a lot of money on the recovery because we didn't invest in that inclusive infrastructure in the first place. So in order to mitigate some of the repairing costs, as opposed to just investing in the inclusive infrastructure in the first place. We need to think about the areas that will be the most impacted. We need to think about the evacuation plans. We need to think about how we can communicate information to the most vulnerable groups and communicate it in accessible formats. For example, Braille, have ASL people conduct webinar, have, conduct, have ASL interpreters conduct webinars and really ensure that there is a general knowledge and so that people can make the best decisions for themselves. And as we conduct this webinar, it is incredibly, incredibly important for us to focus on the solutions as opposed to just acknowledging the problem. And one way to advance the solutions is to think about the economics and externalities of it so we can convince fiscally focused stakeholders to invest in the infrastructure we need to build the world that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Thanks for that. So we have one more panelist, that's Darren Nareen, who joins us from beautiful Trinidad and Tobago. Darren is Vice Chairperson Inclusion and Engagement of the Commonwealth Youth Council, which serves an impressive 1.2 billion youth across the globe. He's a social development specialist and a professional performing artist. He's received a National Youth Award for Leadership from the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, and currently work, works with the Archdiocese Ministry for Migrants and Refugees, where he coordinates a humanitarian response to the migrant and refugee situation in Trinidad and Tobago. So Darian, my question to you is, how important is the role of young people in ensuring gender inclusivity while recovering from disaster? You have six minutes. Over to you, Darian. Thank you so much, Firstly, I must say, what a, what a fantastic, um, you know, panel, panel and uh, webinar this is thus far, and uh, to all the colleagues who have shared um, really excellent points being raised inside there. And I think I, what I want to do is just build on, on what has been said already. Um, and uh, of course, one of the, the threads that we see coming straight throughout this conversation is the idea of building and constructing strong frameworks and policies 
But I want to take the conversation into a, a whole different area as well when it comes to gender mainstreaming and, and gender inclusivity. And that is the grassroots level. I feel as if um, some of the one of the things that we need to be very aware of is the fact that very often the people who are heading the planning of any, of any recovery or any response to any issues uh, with, with regards to disaster are often people who are not from the grassroots level, right? You have very, uh, uh, very often a lot of people who are creating policies, who are, who are doing, who are constructing the response initiatives. They, they tend to, to come from very often the upper, the upper class of society. And I feel as if that becomes very problematic in some areas. Um, when the grassroots level and the indigenous peoples, et cetera, all these different peoples who are the most vulnerable in communities might be left out because their experiences are not raised within a lot of forums, a lot of webinars, a lot of planning initiatives as well. Um, so one of the things I actually wanted to, to bring it back to is to look, of course, at, at class inside, um, class and, and gender as well, when looking at, at a disaster response. And I see that as being very important. Because one of the ways that I really see for us to have a, a firm understanding of, of the proper response for disaster with gender in mind, of course, and with women empowerment in mind, is to look at that grassroots level and grassroots empowerment. And what I mean by that is that we're looking at the community organizations and organizations at the community level that need to be empowered and trained. And some of the things that we need to note is that whenever disaster happens, very often the most vulnerable population don't have access to electricity, they don't have access to water, they probably didn't even have access to that prior to the disaster happening as well in a lot of cases. So sometimes we need to be very cautious in the way that we plan. Um, and what I mean by that is that I've seen many cases, especially during this pandemic currently, where a lot of webinars have, have, been, have been coming up and popping up, et cetera, for trainings. Um, but that excludes a significant portion of the population as well out there who need to, who need certain training to reach to them, who need certain information to reach to them as well. So it's very imperative that we take that into consideration. The fact that the way in which uh, disasters are handled, there's already an equity, right, in the approach and in the policy making and policy construction. So one of the things that I oftentimes bring to the forefront, forefront very often, very often um, is the fact that we need to have, of course, um, policy and planning that takes into consideration these vulnerable groups on that grassroots level. And the best way to reach them, as I mentioned before, is through community action and community engagement and looking at empowering the women who are already in the grassroots level as well, right? Improving their confidence, et cetera, within those spaces. I see that as being, first and foremost, one of the most important things. Um, of course, we have, we have the very major uh, 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 areas that need to be covered almost immediately. And that's looking at your wash protocols, your water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, looking at your, at your uh, PSEA as well, prevention from sexual exploitation and abuse. Looking at your, your prevention of GBV, gender-based violence as well inside there. Um, but these communities at the grassroots level are most vulnerable to this. And therefore, the way in which we approach that is really the question that has to, has to go there, right? Especially within this COVID-19 pandemic, because you have disasters, natural disasters and, and climate disasters that are continuing to take place. But my question is almost immediately um, at, that, at that level, how do we reach the people who might not have access to certain technologies inside there? How do we reach the women at that level within the community? And I think that a lot more thinking has to go into that area as well, um, especially from a youth perspective, because youth has the energy and the ideas and concepts that can really make that huge impact inside there. So some of the short-term solutions and, and I know and long-term solutions that have been raised thus far is of course, um, gender considerations into broader government policy making and advocacy, awareness on gender biases and regulations, policies and budgets. That is good. I think that that is a policy framework level. But then how do we get these, these uh, this awareness, these policies, etc., translated in such a way that is easily absorbed by people at the grassroots level? When we develop these policies, and, and I've seen a lot of fancy policies coming out there, eh? when you read through a lot of these UN policies, etc., it's very nice, right? It's very comprehensive. But can the people at the grassroots level pick that up? Can the women at the grassroots level pick that up? You have some areas and some countries 
where women don't have access to education and don't have access to the uh, to to be able to 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 read it in some cases as well because of the culture of some of these areas where there are a lot of issues happening so in a case like that how do we translate policy in such a way that is absorbed by these people and how do we empower them at that level how do we empower these women at that level and i think that these are some of the areas that we need to move towards thinking as well um, and I see that as being, being important. My concern has always been with the grassroots level. Those people, because they are the majority in the case who are, the, who are impacted the most adversely in a case of climate, climate disaster or in the case of any disaster, any humanitarian disaster, etc. cetera. Um, of course, technical expertise and training on, on gender issues. So those who go into the community, let's say we, we're leaving from, from our different organizations, we're going into the community, we're going to empower the women within, within the community there. It is important that there's a lot of training that takes place and sensitization, not only on the key concepts. It's one thing to know all your, all your abbreviations, but also on the culture that exists within that community. What systems do they already have in place that might be working? What, what are they, have we, have we ever asked, have we ever really sat, sat back and, and asked ourselves and looked at those within the community area and asked what are their responses? What happens as soon as a, a disaster happens? Because humanitarian aid takes a significant period of time to arrive. So do we sit back and we ask ourselves what happens? What is their response? So it's important to bring them into the dialogues as well. So as we leave and, and we go into these areas, I think that is important that we also examine their responses to climate and include that in the policies that are being made at, at, the, at the top up level, right? It must come from that grassroots and enter into policy at the higher level there. So these are just some of, of, of the concepts that I have. I, I see Andrew's back on, so I'm going to assume that my time is up, but um, I always think it's, it's important to, to, to leave with some questions and just, just to shake things up a little bit from, from, that, from that perspective. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm happy to just, to just present very quickly there on, on that, that uh, idea and concept. Thank you so much, Darren. I hate to stop you because I really hear your frustration. And believe it or not, this is a problem that we've been grappling with for decades now. You know, how do you actually reach out to the grassroots? And we don't have a solution. And when it comes to gender, I think it's it's again been something that even at the global level, we've had so much trouble actually gaining some amount of progress. And I think we see that a little bit after the whole Me Too movement you know, but it's only global, it's not yet gotten to the grassroots level. So perhaps we need something like that, something that will shake things up and bring about that change that we want. So I really hear your frustration, but uh, we're a bit short of time now. So I'm going to quickly ask Rita to um, come back to us on, you know, um, based on what she's heard from all of you on what she thinks is the key action points that we should focus on going forward to mainstream gender inclusion and building back better. So Rita, uh, if I can call on you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Anju, and thank you to all the speakers uh, before me, uh, Brighton, Rory, uh, Darian as well. A uh, very passionate, uh, you know, presentation of ideas about what we should be doing going forward. I'll pick up a few. Uh, no one is from Brighton. One of the key action points I noticed from him is that you know make sure that uh, governments' uh, recovery plans and frameworks do have very strong considerations uh, for participation of women and their empowerment. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two that I take from uh, a lot of points that I take uh, from Brighton as well is that I noticed that, you know, there are successful examples of women's participation in several uh, countries and we need to we need to build on those experiences and take it much forward. Um, when I come to Rory, I think she's made a very passionate, a passionate uh, appeal for, you know, ensuring that, you know, when we think about resilient infrastructure from the start, get go, it should take into consideration uh, the need to make it accessible accessible, particularly for the largest group of people who are the most behind, it is women with disabilities. So make sure that we remain, uh, remove barriers, not only for accessible infrastructure, but also uh, have uh, evacuation plans. Um, the other point that she raised very much is uh, implement the green deal, new green deal in areas where the most vulnerable are located and uh, make uh, it mandatory 
you know, inclusive recovery, uh, uh, evacuation mandatory, make communication for people with disabilities a much more uh, accessibility in terms of using different kinds of format, you know, be it for people uh, with hearing disability or visual impairment as well. That's something that was focused on. Uh, finally, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, push about how we think about how the grassroots level movement can be further galvanized to uh, support women's empowerment. You know, that has, uh, that has still a critical gap in doing that. And I think um, important is that all, uh, all the policies that are done at the national and international level are translated uh, to the context, local context, and its application is made understood to the uh, local women's group. And uh, so with that, I think uh, it's a very rich uh, discussion and action points. I would like, not like to try to summarize at all everything, but I hope I've carried the key action points, including uh, the emphasis that, you know, uh, we need to move beyond looking at small changes into looking at a much more long-term transformational change where we are talking about leaping forward rather than, you know, just building back better. So thank you very much, Anju, I hand over back to you. Thanks, Rita. Thanks for summing that up really well. So now we have not very much time, but we'll at least take a couple of questions. I think we have a question here for Darren on how do social norms affect women's access to infrastructure systems and services in recovery? Darren, do you want to take that one? Um, Andrew, you know, uh, to, be, to be quite honest with you, I, I mean, I, I'll touch on it briefly, but as a man, I don't think it's my place to speak on how social norms affect women in 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 a in in, the, in a disaster response. So, um, you know, I, I just don't think it's my place as a man. I, I, I respect okay. that. I respect yeah. that. Yeah, Rory, will you take it then? Sure. Um, can you please repeat the question? It's so the question, question was, uh, how do social norms affect mm -hmm. women's access to infrastructure systems and services in recovery? Yeah, of course. You know, you think about the ways in which women are often more likely to be unemployed. You can also take a racial justice lens as well. And you can think about how African-American women are less likely to be employed. There's employment discrimination there. And when you think about women with disabilities, there's even more of an intersectionality as well. And so I think that as a result, they're less likely to be main, they're less likely to be included in the mainstream discussion because of the marginalization that currently happens based on the social norms where men are more inclined to be employed. They're more likely to be educated in certain areas as well. And so that obviously does have an impact on the ability to even understand um, the importance of creating um, certain practices. And you can also think about the importance of, um, you can also think about the relationship between the social norms in different countries. You can also take a different international lens as well. You can think about um, how women are perceived in those different countries as well and how that affects their ability to access leadership and to be able to create an inclusive recovery plan that also does focus on women because in the disability community, we have a saying called nothing about us without us. And I think that that can also be translated to all of the other different social groups. And I was, I believe it was actually Brighton that was discussing the importance of bringing women to power as well as Rita and how, you know, you need to have those people from those groups in those spaces to be able to affect the change that you want to see. And I think that we need to change those social norms because right now that's not the dominant narrative and that needs to be. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rory. I think we've run out of time now and I don't want to take time away from the virtual exhibition, which really sounds interesting. So I'm gonna hand over back to the organizers and say thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to do this. Thank you to the panelists for your wonderful presentations and uh, thank you to the participants for engaging so well. I hand over to you, Pranja. Oh. Thank you so much, Anju. It was really an insightful session. Thanks to all of you, everyone, panelists and everyone. Uh, now we move on to the launch of virtual exhibition. So now today we have our uh, top 10 winners of the international competition on imagining disaster resilient infrastructure with global youth. The competition was launched under the IDRI campaign under the Youth for Resilient Infrastructure program of CDRI. So we'll be showcasing top 30 entries that we had received from uh, the competition on our website that's going to be our virtual exhibition. To start with it, I would request to put up the presentation uh, for top 10 entries. Thank you for the presentation. 
Our first winner for the competition, we have Noriel from Philippines. Uh, Noriel is currently working as a faculty member under Architecture Department of Technological Institute of Philippines in Manila. Um, uh, moving on, we have Jemson from Philippines. He's a graduate with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Xavier's University uh, with a passion to help and an advocacy to build better communities. He strives to create awareness for youth to accept the greater responsibility of building a sustainable future. Now let's hear from Jemson himself uh, what message he wanted to convey to us from his entry. Jemson, over to you. So greetings to everyone. I am Jameson from the Philippines. So my entry entitled The Perfect Balance was created in combination of my interest in poetry and vision for engineering efficiency with the intention of providing a vivid picture of my vision on a sustainable and resilient future. I chose to submit a video entry as mode of expression, not only because it provides actual facts through reenactment, but because it also showcases realistic emotions given real life situations. In choosing the theme, how nature supports infrastructure resilience, it was simply based on my fascination of nature. As an aspiring civil engineer, it has always been my desire to synergize human society with our God-given nature and strong belief that nature is meant so much more than just a source of sustenance. I've already seen other countries slowly adapting the concept of building eco-friendly infrastructures, incorporating nature into their plans of building resilient communities and as it turns out, improvements were substantial, especially in ensuring human safety. Thus, with my passion to help and advocacy to build better communities, I am determined to create a sense of awareness for each one of us to know that we all have a special role in building a better future. Nature's goodness and provision have always been sufficient to us. Now is the time to understand that we cannot fight nature, we cannot replace nature, but rather work with nature towards a more resilient future. Thank you. Thank you, Jameson. Uh, now we move on to our next winner. That's Janvi from India. She's an undergraduate student of planning of uh, school in a uh, school of planning and architecture, New Delhi. She has lived most of her life around mountains and nature. In her submission, she talks about Uttarakhand, uh, the state which is uh, more prone to disasters. Janvi, over to you. Hi, so for the competition, I prepared this animation which explores Uttarakhand's vulnerability to disasters. So as you know, Uttarakhand is an Indian state. It's also where I live. So it's part of the Himalayas and it's also where a lot of disasters happen, like landslides, flash floods. So growing up and seeing these frequent calamities happen so close to me, it inspired me to take a look at what's really happening. What are these natural and man-made risks? And uh, my main goal with this uh, pre uh, animation was to demystify disasters, as some people still assume that disasters are natural, an act of God, and there's nothing we can do. But that's clearly not true. And as an aspiring young planner, I wanted to make people aware of various interventions and nature-based solutions we can do to reduce disaster risk. Thank you. Thank you, Janvi. Uh, moving on, we have Miriam here with us from Kenya. She has an academic background in environmental sciences and she also works as a, an UN volunteer with UNDRR. Miriam, we would like to hear from you next. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Miriam and I'm from Kenya. I hope I'm audible today. Yes, you are. Yes. So uh, my write up on how nature supports infrastructure resilience was about uh, the crab farming in the coastal areas of Kenya, whereby farmers along the coastal areas of Kenya try to try to farm crabs, which sort of help in preventing the amount of waves that hit the coastal communities. So by this, I thought that uh, it, it's a way that nature tries to absorb shocks that we may be experiencing naturally from the environment without being prepared in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, further, we have Shavindri from United Kingdom. Shavindri is a full-time researcher at Global Disaster Resilience Center at the University of Huddersfield. Uh, Shavindri, we would like to hear from you. Uh, hello, hope you all can hear me. 
Uh, well, I'm a full-time researcher, as uh, uh, they mentioned, uh, attached to the Global Disaster Resilience Center at the University of Huddersfield, UK, and also a final year at my doctoral studies. I got to know about this competition through Professor Delanthi Amaratunga, who is a renowned character in the field of disaster risk management. And writing has always been my childhood passion, and that's how I submitted this poem to this competition. I have been born and raised in Sri Lanka, and before coming to the UK, I have been a ground level practitioner in the Sri Lankan construction industry. Practicing in the construction industry made me realize how far the disaster risk has been ignored in the real case scenario. That's why I wrote the necessity of incorporating disaster resilient infrastructure through a poem. As a humans, we have come a long way in terms of technology and our building architecture and infrastructure is simply amazing. But we often ignore the possibility of a disaster taking place at any moment, at anywhere in the world. Especially, we cannot eliminate disaster risk completely. Therefore, the only solution is incorporating a safety net around our infrastructure. Therefore, I have demonstrated the necessity of incorporating disaster resilience into our day-to-day -day infrastructure through a, role play, through a role play between the humans and the uh, disaster. And the poem elaborates the necessity of disaster resilient infrastructure. Hope you will enjoy my write-up. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Shavendri. Moving on, we have Mashkura joining us from Bangladesh. Uh, Mashkura has completed her bachelor's in architecture from Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology in Bangladesh. She likes to engage herself in creative works like painting, sketchbooking, and etc. Uh, we would like to hear from you, Mashkura, next. Moving on, we have uh, Deki from Bhutan. Currently, she's an undergraduate. Hello. Uh, the, the main thing is this in everywhere. We will come back to Mashkura later. Uh, we'll move on to Deki from Bhutan. Uh, she is currently an undergraduate student pursuing Bachelor's of Architecture in College of Science and Technology under the Royal University of Bhutan. Uh, Deki, what message you wanted to convey us from your entry? We would like to hear it. Warm greetings to everyone. Uh, I'm Deki Chodun Bhutan. Uh, this is my art, art composition named Bridge to a Better uh, Future. Uh, this was inspired by strategies implemented by many uh, climate change movements such as institution of greenery in uh, building facades, uh, spreading awareness and educating peoples on these uh, points. Um, so I try to uh, so I try to uh, showcase the changes we can uh, embrace in the world uh, by creating a contrast between the past we've experienced with all the disasters, uh, turmoils, and the future, which is. Uh, which is very uh, filled with greeneries and everything uh, by uh, connecting it with the strong bridge created with better knowledges and uh, involvement of all the uh, peoples, prof uh, all the groups of people. Uh, this graphic adds um, value to the DRI as it advocates that it, as it advocates um, DRI's um, ways and uh, plans as right way to uh, right way towards building uh, disaster resilient infrastructure and um, the uh, greater matter that my uh, art composition tries to convey is the need for uh, increase in uh, better knowledge of professionals in order to uh, build uh, structures that are disaster resilient and uh, by considering uh, parameters like climate, climate conditions and energy efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Deki. Further, we have Jesse with us representing Shadow Arts Theatre Organization from Philippines. The organization is engaged in artistry of manipulating shadows through a range of mediums uh, like mainly pu puppets. So Jesse, we would like to hear from you. Yes, hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jesse Ocampado from 
representative of Shadow Art City Organization from Philippines. So we we are the Shadow Art City Organization or so-called Sato from Palo Leite, Philippines. Experience the monstrous disaster super typhoon Haiyan or or super typhoon Yolanda eight years ago. So we underwent a lot of sacrifice and faced trauma after the typhoon. So. We were inspired to choose the specific topic of community preparedness or community resilience due, the, due to the numerous casualties happening here because of the lack of information mostly in the remote areas or highly risk. So where people don't know what a simple word like storm surge means. So um, the greater message that are in train tries to convey in terms of resilience infrastructure. So um, the message that our entry tries to convey in terms of resilience infrastructure is an effort to look back at what happened to, to us eight years ago. So before we proceed to other matters and other projects, let us first educate our community step by steps, like educate them about what is storm surge, <laughs> Um, educate them of what and where are the high risk or hazard. In other words, we are trying to reach out the community and hold a participatory disaster risk assessment. So, in our, if our organization is given a chance to be part of CDR, CDRI team, we will do anything to reach out the, the communities to help them build capacities through our unique presentation and teaching techniques so that if the super typhoon hits our place in the future, we will have zero casualties and all us will become resilient. Thank you, Thank that's you. all. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, further, we just have two of our winners left. Uh, next one is Rexon from Cameroon. Uh, Rexon is a student at the School of Mining Engineering in Cameroon. Rexon, we would like to hear from you. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Hope I'm audible enough. Uh, what prompted me to choose the topic infrastructure vulnerability was due to the present state of my country, where almost every domain of infrastructure, such as road electricity, network infrastructure, and so many others are being attacked by threats. My chosen topic adds value to DRI by generating awareness for my country and the world at large of what infrastructure vulnerability is and also provokes people to take action in putting up infrastructures that are resilient. My entry focuses more on portraying the negative effects when infrastructures are not built to mitigate disaster risks. I believe that my, by portraying these negative effects, it will bring to the knowledge of people the, the causes and effects of non-resilient infrastructure. It will in turn also push people to have the consciousness of putting up infrastructures that will stand the test of time, that is stand the test of disasters and prevent destruction that leads to several other destructions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rexon. And last but not the least, we have Achal here with us. Achal is a graduate with literature background and currently pursuing bachelor's in education. Along with her, her team includes Webo, who is a graduate with geography background and master's in disaster management. Achal, we would like to hear from you. Hope I'm audible enough to everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. A very good evening to everyone. Well, uh, talking about my entry, so basically it was a comic wherein we uh, talked about, so you can just see an image of an earth. So basically this comic first spoke about earth, how, how beautiful mother earth was, but then because of human negligence and literally whatever we have done to destroy it, how badly the earth was affected. But then it highlights the major role which was played by the disaster warriors who included a lot of solutions which was further uh, addressed in the comic. I'm personally extremely passionate about the environment and I make sure that I do my bit towards enhancing sustainability. Um, I, along with my brother, we belong to an Indian state which is extremely prone to disasters and has seen many in the past. And talking about Uttarakhand over here, this is precisely what was mentioned with, uh, from, by Janvi as well. So uh, these are the two primary reasons why I chose this topic and I chose to make the comic out of it. We, we actually chose to make the comic out of it. This comic highlights nature-based solutions, which are not impossible to implement and are pretty prevalent. 
However, that's exactly where we terribly lack the implementation, right? Because of, even when we see the government, no matter how much laws and how many policies we make, until we implement them, we really can't solve the problems. And that's where we terribly lack. The biggest message that the comic tries to convey is awareness, is generating and spreading awareness. And I believe that everything starts with us as a human being. So we need to take action as soon as possible and as much as possible. Given the contemporary time when nearly every other day we hear about some disaster occurring somewhere in the world, I think that the focus needs to be more on making the infrastructure resilient so that we avoid the loss of life and the destruction that happens along with that. So that's precisely what my comic can be. Thank you so much once again, Siri Arai, for, for this opportunity. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, everyone, for your entries. Uh, once again, congratulations to everyone. The virtual exhibition is live on our website. I would request to uh, everyone to visit the exhibition uh, for looking at some amazing entries there. And lastly, um, on the behalf of CDRI Secretariat and our organizing team, I thank you everyone for joining the session. Looking forward to your continued support and engagement. So uh, I, Pranjal, along with my fellow young professionals and our CDRI team, uh, signing off here. Thank you. <laughs>